And good afternoon, everybody. Today is our week six lunch and learn focus today on leading and motivating with fierce resolve. Uh, obviously, that's part of our pure leadership power module. It's something that we'll keep coming back to uh, to strengthen our skills, knowledge, and abilities. Uh, the opportunity today is really in line with what it is that you are working on that is uh, starting on your first project, A3 Thinking, learning how to be a problem solver and create problem solvers within your department. One of the uh, key critical um, opportunities here is to start working with people, uh, both who work for you, your peers to your left and to your right, and those uh, who are above you, uh, to try to get things done. And that is something part of our everyday life. Uh, we have to get stuff done, and we're not always getting it done in the time frame uh, that we set out to do. So the again, motivating with fierce resolve is about being as soft as necessary, but as firm as needed. Uh, you need to be, and there's really four levels of motivation, uh, which I will be talking about uh, today. And there will be some uh, opportunity to maybe for, for some of you to share uh, some stories that you have uh, or experience that you have run into and how you best mitigated that or how you plan on, on utilizing your newly developed skills as you go forward. Uh, interesting enough, this week I had a uh, good opportunity to work with my uh, my mentor um, at a uh, what we call an unbridled horse workshop, where we brought in uh, leaders uh, from a company uh, from a finance company, this was an accounting firm, where we taught them the pure leadership model, uh, and we spent a lot of time around uh, this motivating with fierce resolve, as is in, in regards to how horses need to be led. Um, not controlled. And, and it's really about having an understanding that not about telling people what to do, uh, but, but by demonstrating, showing, leading, and then utilizing your four levels of motivation to get them to actually uh, understand why it needs to be done, um, including you know, recognizing abundantly uh, along the way, even celebrating the small little successes. The inter interesting story was shared, and, and, and I think it's worth uh, talking about that for a minute, is that uh, you know, we talk about business, we talk about our professional lives, but really this is highly relevant at home. As most of uh, you have teenage children or are thinking about it or, uh, you know, will have someday in the future, uh, crossing uh, your, the path or of, of trying to get your teenager to keep a clean room uh, is going to be an extremely difficult, uh, uh, you know, part of leading and managing uh, your household. And, but it also tends to show your leadership style and how you lead or sometimes control uh, or try to control the environment itself. And the example was brought up that was not in this academy, but the previous one, somebody who was uh, you know, in the horse ring and really demanding and barking at the horses and trying to uh, you know, get it to do that. Uh, and, and through observation of that, uh, of that gentleman, the question was really asked, is that, you know, is this the way you interact uh, with your children after he had expressed some concerns about the level of relationship that he had with his kids? Long story short, um, yes, and, and, and the way he would, um, the expectation that he has set of his kids is to clean the room. And when he would go into the room and he would see four things done, the six things not done, he would concentrate on the six things that were not done. And, and really what ended up being is the children got so disengaged uh, uh, because they were you know, disappointing their father, so to speak, but really more importantly, no matter what they did, it was never good enough. That's the feeling they got out of it. And because of that, they got disengaged. They spent less time worrying about the two or three, four things they did well. So a true conversation and show and tell uh, he learned that I did you even have to celebrate with abundance the little things that people do well. So in this regard, celebrate the two or three things that they did well uh, without harping on the things that they did not do well. And then slowly elevating the, uh, you know, the service expectation by utilizing the techniques we'll talk about in a minute. So think about that for yourself, that you know, the four levels of motivation come into play you know, throughout different parts of our lives. And, and it's really a good training ground uh, for bringing it to work, right? It, it needs to work in all different kinds of scenarios. So as Dwight Eisenhower says here, is that motivation is the art of getting people to do 
what you want them to do because they want to do it. And that's where the, the control that you release is that we have to motivate them to the point and get them to buy into the point that they, it almost feels like they came up with the solution and they want to do it, right? If you then measure their performance in the visual environment, performance tends to go up, right? Instead of telling people what to do, especially telling it without the proper context behind it. So the four basic principles that we have spoken about that are responsibilities of a leader is to love those you lead. It is about both love and tough love. The tough love piece of it uh, often is connected to people who are non-performing. Right? It is not about telling them how horrible they are or demeaning, but it is about having a sit down with the person in a safe environment where you can take the opportunity to listen to, to, to them and by asking what is not going well. And then uh, being really honest and open and clear around expectations. Right? And then allowing them to suggest on how they're going to uh, you know, close the, the gap between what is expected of them and what it is. Meanwhile, we want to make sure that we separate their worth from performance. It is lead to context, not control. Really lead to context, meaning that we have to go the extra step to get their buy-in. Now, as you go into your projects and as you develop your problem statements, uh, right? That is, you know, we have all kinds of processes. If you want to improve them, we have to come up with the problems and what is it that we're trying to prove? Or what is the opportunity? We need to get the buy-in of the people who are in involved in this, right? If you just do it in a vacuum, you're going to control it. But that's what we're trying to avoid, right? If you control things, if you tell them to, to, to do something, people are less responsive to that. Even with regulatory requirements, right? You already know the outcome of the regulatory requirement. It's still best to have them be part of the process of implementation so they, they feel they're part of the conversation, understand, and are easier to buy into the process. Ensuring a winning environment, meaning that we need to create a safe environment, right? Both physical and psychological safety. We want to make sure that people are part of the process. We don't, uh, you, you don't go to the lowest demeanor in order to get things accomplished and crossed away, right? Nobody feels good about that stuff. And using the power of focus is really both you focusing on one thing at a time, but it is also about making sure that we have it tightly scoped, right? That we, we don't go in, in a mile wide and an inch deep, right? It is truly we want to go an inch wide and a mile deep. So the power of focus can be utilized in, in many different aspects of management and leadership, is, but it is one of your responsibilities as a leader. So the tool that we provided to you is about the four phases of motivation. It is about getting a deeper understanding on how to utilize the tools. So I would re highly recommend that all of you print out this out of your manual that we have provided to you or take a screenshot and keep it close by. Now, this is not something that you will say, you know, I read it once and I'll implement it. Keep it close by and follow this script to some extent. But I just want to make sure that we all understand it is a phase one, two, three, four, right? Plus and pause, a timeout in the middle. We are not prescriptive on how quickly you have to go from phase one to phase four, because that is highly dependent on the situation at hand, right? That requires situational leadership. There are times that the, the urgency is so great, the building is on fire, you can suggest, you can even ask, but the, the, the suggesting, asking, and directing, and taking actions, or doing it yourself, or leading the way, or getting somebody's attention by, by being more firm might have to all be done in a matter of minutes. All right, so understand that this model is, is very effective, but it requires your situational awareness to understand on how quickly you want to escalate. The same token is not every single conversation that you have where you try to motivate, where you're trying to get something accomplished. If you go to take action, step four, um, it, it, it requires you to go to human resources or it requires you to get a performance improvement plan into place, right? So there are different ways and different levels, but not doing it by sticking to, I'm suggesting you to do it by being just asking and not doing a reassessment of yourself. Did I have a clear purpose statement? Did I, was I strong enough in my message? 
Is there anything that I need to do different in order to get the message across? It's a difference between being nice and, and, being, and, and being a leader, right? In healthcare, we tend to be too nice, too concerned about people's feelings. And, and therefore, we don't take it to the next step that some people require us to take to. Uh, take it to, right? Is they are really taking themselves there. If they don't, you know, follow through on the things you're requesting. So as you go into the projects, there is likely going to be a request made of each of the team, member, team members, especially when you start drawing out your current state or when you have a discussion around your future state or when you start brainstorming and start developing solutions you will require actions or things to be done by the team members on that project. Now, if you have all high-performing team members who are gung-ho and fully committed and self-directed, right, that's the ultimate outcome we want to have from our folks, then merely suggesting is likely going to be good enough for them to respond and get the work done. Right? So your responsibility as a leader is to make sure that there's clear communication, right? And we discuss it together. It's not about I, it's about we. Make sure that there is engagement across the team itself. And every step that you take, you want to recognize abundantly. Now, again, recognition of the first step approach could be, uh, you know, in a follow-up email or a phone call, or maybe even a handwritten card. Right? It's a highly motivator for people to, to feel that they are part of something bigger than themselves. Right? As, an, as a leader who leads with confident humility, this is no longer about you. It's not about your results, but it is really about them. Right? It's outward. It's thinking about how and what you're going to be doing to inspire and motivate your team to lift them up to a higher level of performance. But if you don't, if, they, if there is no response when we are suggesting, right, when we, and that really is the early adopters will likely engage at that particular level. Sometimes we have to you know, take it up a bit and say, we want to ask. And that is really about guide them to determine an action plan that will achieve the desired results. It's just, just a little bit more of a nudge. Right? Instead of waving now, you want to make you poke just a little bit. You're a little bit more uh, intense about it. Again, you have to be mindful of your body language, your spoken language, the energy that you bring into this conversation itself. Right? You don't want to tell them what to do at this point in time. You don't want to give them, uh, you know, the menu. You still want them. To, you want to engage them to the point of motivating them to come up with their own solutions and process steps. And again, here too, is if you have just small successes in the right direction, point them out by recognizing them abundantly. And if you feel you get no response out of phase one and phase two, in other words, the horse is still just standing there and not doing or is moving around in directions that you don't want it to go, either that is your the person, the, the, your team member, the first thing you want to do is really kind of take a time out. You want to take a very, um, you know, a, a intentional pause and kind of do a self-check. You know, have I not communicated this correctly? Right? Is there anything that I have missed? Right? Have I not created this safe environment where I'm asking people for their input? But have I not been judgmental in my process? I, we need to lower that insecurity. Are the people on the team, the people you're asking, too busy that they don't have the bandwidth to spend time? Have I done enough to try to create bandwidth? Or have I done enough to have a conversation with their bosses to allow them and empower them to be part of this particular project? Right, through that process of discovery, you will find those who are either just disengaged because they're bored and they're on the non-committed, maybe even on the saboteur level, right? It is not even uh, over it. It's, it is, it's clear that they are not, uh, you know, interested or not willing and not capable. So that would require you to then to take a different step that they remain as part of your team 
at large, right? And so that really uh, uh, gets you to that phase three. And here it becomes even more important to really be in tune with your energy that you put into it. Right? If you bring a lot of positive energy, you'll get you're more likely to receive that back from your team members. You come in hard and harsh and negative, that likely will shut them down and get the opposite effect that you're looking for, right? But it requires you to stop being nice and becoming more definitive, right? You wanna be candid by stating the impact that they're having to, you know, on, on, uh, on the team or on the project itself, right? You wanna talk about the consequences of their behavior. Right, and then instead of telling them what needs to be done, you can concentrate about what is the desired outcome? What is it that you're after? And again, go back and say, what is your action plan? What is your timeline to get to the results that we are seeking? Now, again, using that partnership module, right? Assessing and understanding where you are on that partnership. Are they you know, disconnected, disengaged? Are you compatible? Are you synergistic? Is there work that I need to do to, to repair that relationship? Right, that's an ongoing basis of evaluating and, and trying to make progress as a team, multiple individuals, or individual members on your team itself. Don't forget to recognize abundantly. And then if that is not working, then you need to get it to the next level of taking what we call a phase four. And now is not a pointing, not a wiggle, not not pushing, but it's actually being a little bit more forceful right, to, to get to the point that they really understand if, if, you, if we don't follow through, there is going to be real consequence of inaction. Now here you can go to a performance improvement plan if that's appropriate. Here it is appropriate to clearly say that if you don't uh, complete the, the task, then you're off the team. If you can go to the point of telling them that you are very disappointed in their performance. And it's often those words will have the greatest sting on the people who have some sense of commitment to the organization or to the team itself. Right? But you still want to look at the root causes of why they are not engaged to the level that you need them to be and continue to work on trying to remove those barriers. Again, that last ditch effort, instead of giving up, you want to spend a little bit more energy on trying to rebuild relationships in order to get desired outcomes. Again, these four phases of motivation can be escalated in a manner of minutes, depending on the burning platform, right? How quickly do you need to move? Now, there's an intention behind the project phase of the program itself that we set it up in three weeks. Right, there's a clear outcome as we're looking for in week number one, week number two, week number three. So this will allow you to utilize these levels of motivation to get your team members to do the things that you ask them to do, right? That, that is part of their buy-in. And it starts with having a crystal clear problem statement. What are the consequences? What, are the, what is the impact on the organization if we don't do something? Of course, remember the problem statement does not include a solution. And why that is important, because you want to empower your team to drive the solutions, right? So your, your clarity of message is really, really important, both on what it is that we have and where it is that we want to go, right? Well, what is the ultimate outcome that we desire? Any questions here? I can pause for two minutes. Is anything that, that somebody has a question about or have you used this technique? Um, or, or, you know, let me know a couple of opinions about that. All right, not all at the same time. All right, so likely this is new to you on, on how, to, how to do this. So I, I look forward to having the discussions on our one-to-one -one conversations on how you have discussions with your team members utilizing these four phases of motivation. All right, so uh, we'll move on to the next one is that there are five essential behaviors 
of motivation that you are in charge of for yourself. To be successful, to help drive this. Again, this is something you can put on your screen and say, you really need to be as soft as possible and as firm as it takes. I, this requires your emotional intelligence to be high, your behavioral capacity to be high. Now, I fully recognize that we are nice people in healthcare, that having an, a difficult conversation is not one of those things that we do best. But we do need to recognize that having those conversations, learning to have those conversations, will be very helpful in gaining you know, performance or becoming a better leader. Too often we spend an enormous amount of time thinking about what the other will say before we go into a difficult conversation. That is allowing people to live rent-free in your head. If you would only think back for yourself on how many minutes, hours, or days you have thought about that, and then often don't follow through on actually having that conversation and just letting it slip by for another breakdown to happen in the future. The goal here is for you to learn and to have these conversations. And I can tell you, I've had these conversations with doctors and nurses. <clears throat> we have coach physician leaders. And they often have, you know, real difficulty having a difficult conversation with a peer or a subordinate. You know, they are professionals. They're very smart. They know what they're doing. They're self-directed. They're committed. But even in those circumstances, from time to time, you need to have a difficult conversation. Again, to be as soft as possible and firm as it takes, but you need to do it. And what we found is that all the time and energy that went into thinking about it, once they have had the conversation with the person, they come back and say, well, I should have done this days, weeks, months ago. Because often the receiver was not even aware of their own behavior. But now that it was pointed out to them and, and realigned and recommitted to what the outcome, the desired outcomes is, you have a lot of these aha moments. So again, these, for, for, for those of you who lead frontline staff, you likely can have these conversations on a daily basis or avoid them. All right, so improving your skills, knowledge, abilities around how, you know, ways to have these motivational conversations. Don't look at them as negative conversations. Motivational conversations is really important, right? Preserve choice, don't force. Don't tell them what to do. Give them an opportunity to select on how to do it, but be accountable to that, right? If they say, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z this week to get close to the goal, then follow up in days or week to come to ensure that they actually took those steps. If they didn't, then again, you can escalate that, right? Always maintain the dignity of others. Separate that worth from performance. It's important for people to feel that self-worth and, and, and think about their values. Keep in the back of your mind also the cultural background of the people that you're working with, right? Culture can have a lot to do with it. Here. Never be mean or angry. If you come with negative energy, you're going to get negative energy. You come in too hard, it'll shut down. You might as well end the conversation before it even starts. And use positive reinforcement continually, right? That separate that worth from performance. Tell them that you believe in them, right? Use the word of empowerment. How can you help? What, what, what do you suggest? Listen to them deeply. I right? then help shape the message. Any questions on this topic? All right, the next one is the intrinsic recognition. I'm not going to go over it today because we've done this several times. This is where you, this is the tool that you utilize as you look for ways to abundantly celebrate and recognize the people that you work with. So if you go into a team, if you've done this with your own team, you have them circle one or two things that, that, that makes them tick, great. Now you go into a team that is not necessarily people that are subordinates. You can use this too. Ask them to circle the things that are most important to them. This gives you intel on that person on how to recognize them along the way, to elevate their, their spirit, right? To be, to be very positive. So last one uh, then is the guidelines to recognition. 
right? So I think the intrinsic value is a really good way to start to strive to recognize intrinsically first, then and uh, extrinsic recognition. But that would mean is to try to be as close to target to what it is that they're asking for, what they appreciate, before you do something more general like a pizza. I recognize is given correctly performance improves. I, I know that some of you already have been giving out some of the handwritten cards and 100% of you who have done it have received some level of positive feedback with, you know, with, with, with people who were you know, quite amazed that you took the time to write that card. It's extremely powerful, right? And the same thing can be done on your project team. Provide timely recognition when things are done right and correct, uh, correct the feedback when off track, timely, concise, and with feeling. And with feeling means that you need to take the time to have that conversation with them. Don't push it back, don't avoid it. Uh, you need to look at your own behavioral capacity. You have to go back to that, to your behaviors, right? In the, in the first step when we learn to lead with confident humility, what if, if one of your weaknesses follow through and commitment, then you have to be even more aware of that in these types of scenarios, right? You have to follow through, be positive and do it in a timely manner. Don't let too much space between what happened and what you, you know, desired outcomes. Recognize the effort and reward the result. Right? There's a difference between appreciation and rewarding. Appreciation can be done every day. Doesn't have to be performance based and rewarding is about an actual outcome that meets, meets or exceeds. All right, there, isn't, there is a simple exercise that is in your book. You can take it on the screen over here to make a self assessment on how to recognize abundantly. Right? You have to, again, dig a little deeper for yourself and say, what are your natural strengths with regard to motivating with fierce resolve? What have you already been doing for years that is part of who you are at the core? Right? That is something you don't need to think about. That, that, that is something that just flows out of you. And all of you have aspects of that, right? That made you in high performance to start up with. What is that? Right? And then the second thing is what identify what your blind spots and weaknesses are regarding motivating with fierce resolve. What is it that you try that you avoid? Do you avoid conversation? Do you avoid uh, recognition or appreciation? Is your paradigm uh, too high? Do you aim for perfection rather than incremental improvement and celebrating that? Right? Recognize where you are so you can then start making improvements. From an action standpoint, what is the most significant thing you want to focus on to be more motivating with fierce results? You can go back to leveraging your strength and to become more aware of your blind spots, right? And then count it, measure that appropriately. And then how you apply that is to describe the situation where you will apply this new focus. So that's the promise to yourself. Now I would suggest you carry this over, especially the blind spots, if that's what you want to work on, Carry this over to your scorecard and add that item to it. And several of you already have put that onto your scorecards. And if you have a difficulty with commitment, then, then be honest and open to that, right? And make, make sure you do that. Some of you say, I need to get better at having conversations with people who I'm not, uh, who are not working with me. Right? That, that is again, that, that's a really good start by making corrective, uh, corrective uh, changes to your behaviors that will lead to better outcomes. Um, so this is the end of today's uh, uh, Lunch and Learn. Uh, I'll open it up for a couple more minutes after I stop the recording for a discussion. Let me stop that.